Welcome to the Multi-Species Salon. I'm Evan Kirksey, and here with some colleagues in the Environmental Humanities Program at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, today we have the great pleasure of uh, speaking with uh, uh, Laura Ogden from Dartmouth, uh, who's actually physically in the Ever Everglades and is going to tell us about the letter D for diaspora. Thank you. Um, I am more physically in my kitchen near the Everglades. Um, I'm going to... My talk is uh, called D is for Diaspora, and it's about work that I've been doing lately in um, Tierra del Fuego on the Chilean side. Um, this is a photograph uh, that was taken at Carunquinca Nature Park, which is on Tierra del Fuego's largest island called Isla Grande. Uh, not long ago, rivers rushed through these mountain valleys. Now, beaver dams have slowed these rivers to a soft, steady trickle. Water diverted forms vast shallow pools that saturate and kill the surrounding forest. Karunkinka's most urgent conservation problem is environmental change related to the introduction of beavers. I began my research in Tierra del Fuego because I was interested in understanding the ways in which certain animals and plants became constructed as out of place and a threat to particular visions of nature. This paper is part of a broader project that I'm calling Speculative Wonder at the World's End. From speculative realism to speculative capitalism, what the speculative evokes varies considerably. And I'm using it building from the work of Isabel Sangers, the, the Belgian philosopher of science, and I'm using the term to signal what I'm calling a thought experiment that enables the investigation of alternative ways of encountering the world and by extension provokes the possibility for alternative environmental politics. The speculation here is a thought experiment about invasive species. One where we cast aside the idea of the species as something concrete and static and singular. Um, I can't really go through the whole thought experiment now, but, but this diagram that you see kind of lays it out. Um, and so what I do is I first I, I recast invasive species as animal diasporas. That's the D. Then I show how beavers in Tierra del Fuego are entangled in very different political ecological assemblages. Now I'm calling these two, and you'll hear me talk about these, uh, these two assemblages. One is called forest beaver, and the other is called pampas beaver. Pampas is, is a grassland, basically. The end result of this speculative experiment is a reconsideration of the concept of the species itself. In 1946, the Argentine government imported 25 pair of beavers to Tierra del Fuego in the hopes of starting a fur trade. Uh, if we have time, I'll tell you how they got there, which is quite funny. <coughs> if these things go, this economic development strategy was not very successful. Soon after their arrival, the beavers moved into Chile and Tierra del Fuego and began to occupy most of the islands within the archipelago, as this map that a colleague of mine made shows. Conservation biologists have described the environmental change related to the beaver introduction as being as significant as the last ice age. I'm using diaspora, the term, in an attempt to resist a kind of biologism of origin. I recognize that the term diaspora applied to non-human beings produces an uncomfortable tension, one that I share. At the same time, I think there's something very productive in this tension, in that it illustrates the challenges inherent to an ethics of living and dying where the human is not central. Understanding why certain species are considered objects and therefore killable, rather than subjects and therefore less killable, has been central to posthumanist philosophy and to associated scholarship. In the case of invasive species, the logic of killability is predicated on a politics of pure and stable nature that no one really believes. In Tierra del Fuego, few conversations about beavers stray beyond the probabilities of eradication. Now, forest beavers, remember that's my first typology, are entangled in very different, a very different assemblage of beings than their kin in the pampas. Let me explain. All kinds of speculative logics associated with the commodification of life have captured the forests of Tierra del Fuego. 
Most notably, these forests were once the center of a forest conservation battle that included anti-forest activists in the Pacific Northwest and debt brokers at the Goldman Sachs Corporation. Too complicated to tell here, but the effort to protect these forests became the first victory for a post-dictator Chilean environmental movement. What is clear, beavers live in a forest governed by a logic of forest arborescence. Forest arborescence, following Deleuze and Guattari, offers a timeless vision of pure nature. Though this kind of forest love is common to the wilderness paradigm throughout the world, it has a specificity that emerges out of a particular Chilean context. Many of the environmental activists who became kind of radicalized they first became radicalized within a social movement context as human rights activists and peace activists under the dictatorship. Now for these environmentalists, deforestation is really for them linked to the same kind of human rights issues that they've been cared about all along. The deforestation for environmentalists in Chile becomes a threat to life itself. And this is deforestation whether it's a company out of Bellingham, Washington who's cutting down trees or beavers. So this is the assemblage where the forest beaver lives. It's a forest assemblage littered with the debris of older forms of life commodification. But for environmentalists who are profoundly attached to the forest, beavers pose a distinct challenge to an ethics of life and living that underlies their commitments. All kinds of animals, though, are remaking Tierra del Fuego, many of them recent. These include rabbit, foxes, mink, and others. But pound per pound, sheep make up the most significant of these animal diasporas. For the most part, Tierra del Fuego is a working agrarian landscape, even though we don't tend to think of it that way. Vast sheep farms occupy the northern part of Isla Grande, where my, the park is that I'm working, as they do the rest of southern Patagonia. Since 1877, the island of Isla Grande has been dominated by sheep, with an average of two to three million sheep roaming the Pampas for the past century. While sheep are ever-present, they are largely invisible in the debates about invasive species. This invisibility tells us a lot about the ways in which we value animal life. Now, much to the surprise of the biologists who study beavers, and so exciting, Beavers on Isla Grande have adapted to the steppe ecology, which is called the Pampas, where sheep roam. These Pampas beavers, as I call them, behave in ways that differ significantly from the behavior of the forest beavers. For instance, they eat different foods, they use different vegetation to create their dams. This is a landscape that is littered with, the, the, with sheep. It has bones and fur and dried excrement all across the Pampas. So it's not surprising that beavers make use of sheep bones in their dam construction, such as the one you see there on the screen. Much to the dismay of ranchers, they also, beavers, love wooden fence posts. Now, most owners and shepherds, the ones that I interviewed there, for, do not mind beavers. And beavers are not objects of concern. Instead, shepherds tend to worry about things like the lambs freezing to death, Owners worry about things like the cost of production. They're really interested in imported new management techniques from South Africa. They're interested in the price of wool. If people on Estancias mention beavers at all, it is with wonder at the appearance of these large ponds. Because these ponds, of course, supply fresh water to sheep in a fairly arid landscape. Now, pampas beavers are enmeshed in an assemblage of animal diasporas where sheep, dogs, shepherds, and now beavers make and remake each other. Pampas beavers are both same and different from forest beavers. The Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Vivieros de Castro, in a recent reflection on the notion of species in anthropology, has argued that the species is really a point of view, but a point of view that is relational rather than singular and static. In other words, it's a principle of relation rather than distinction. What happens if we broaden our ideas to one of multi-species relationality, where the species in these relations is always contingent, always part of an assemblage? What happens in our experiment if the idea of the species goes away? 
I think what happens is that instead of some great Canadian species invasion, we begin, and we perhaps we should consider with wonder, how entities become through their relations with other beings and things, how they negotiate historically constituted patterns of sameness and difference through diaspora. I started this paper talking about the speculative. I want to end with wonder. On land, beavers are graceless, but their ponds offer a lightness of being, a safe tranquility. The calm of a snow globe, sediments drift along the water column. Beavers are night creatures, nocturnal. Of course, they may not even notice the dark as they have such poor eyesight. In a hazy blur, their world is profoundly enlightened by scent and sound. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I'd like to. And stop sharing. <laughs> Great. Right there. So, so I'd love to invoke uh, uh, the work of one of our colleagues here, who's not present physically, um, uh, Tom Van Doren, who who's talked about. Um, yeah. Uh, foxes in, in Australia, and and pointed out that you know as as much as some people uh, would not like them to be there at this current moment in history, we're at a point where um, it's simply impossible to scrape them off of uh, the the ecological communities as they are now to some uh, imagined earlier state. And and he looks at um, the way that people talk about eradication and um, uh, simply points out that it's, it's not a realistic or, or possible goal at, at this point. And you, you mentioned eradication briefly with respect to these di diasporas of beavers, and I, I would love to hear in a cosmopolitical idiom um, what sort of strategies people have developed for getting along um, in, in this world um, where, where beavers very much are apart and quite probably like the fox are never going to go away. I think that um, so in a in a in a less than cosmopolitical way and in much more in a political way, um, beavers are ge a geopolitical problem in some ways. In that, so they are introduced from Argentina, and they go into Chile across there. And and Chile and Argentina have always had this, this these tensions about the border there that goes through Patagonia, and so on the Chilean side. Um, Chileans always talk about these Argentinian uh, beavers, um, and so so there's all kinds of politics that have sort of entangled these beavers, not just the politics of eradication or the possibilities of eradication, but definitely um, the thing that's the thing about Tierra del Fuego, which may be akin to parts of Australia, I don't know, is that um, it has a very very low density of people, so. Um, on the Chilean side of Tierra del Fuego, there's just uh, maybe 5,000 people. Uh, so ranchers, uh, ranchers on on uh, are, don't really care much about don't talk about eradicating beavers too much. But it's very much much more of a global environmental uh, concern, and now it's become more of a, a state-sponsored natural resource concern. And so, and in those milieu, it is only about eradication. Yeah. So there isn't. Does that does that answer your question? I mean, all people talk about is the ways in which is it or isn't it possible to get rid of them. And, and it sort of leads into my second question. So Stefan Helmreich has has said that in the case of invasive species, a, a story that seems to be uh, a simple, uh, s simple one about natural or cultural agency actually turns out to be a story about the social judgment of harm. And and in your talk, you you indicated that on the pampas, uh, the the sheep ranchers have more or less passed a social judgment of harmlessness. And it seems like these logics of eradication are very closely tied to timber production, and that that social harm is is judged in that context. Yeah, I think I think for environmentalists, it's not about timber as much as it is about um, for them. I, I think about uh, for 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 environmentalists the and and conservation biologists, but mainly environmentalists who work there. Um, and and I don't think these are necessarily distinct categories, um, but that um, 
I th the landscape feels like it's saturated in green. I mean, um, the the love the ways in which beavers have really transformed that landscape is is incredibly stunning. They're in every river valley there, uh, or 98 percent of all river valleys in Tierra del Fuego, and so. For environmentalists um, and conservation folk, um, it is about uh, harm, but I think more so not even in a kind of economic way, but in a real sort of um, uh, a kind of attachment way that I'm calling forest arborescence, you know, mm -hmm. a kind of forest love. Yeah. And, and to me, it seems like there's there's something special about the beaver and, and other kinds of critters that are um, going wild in, in new ways in, in this era that some folks call the Anthropocene. So, you know, there's foxes here in Australia. There's rhesus macaques in, in Florida. Um, I, I've, I've got another keyword that I'll introduce eventually, um, the ontological amphibian, playing with uh, uh, P Peter Slaughterdyke, who insists that... Um, uh, animals are trapped in the umwelt while the the human has broken through to ontological cagedness, cagelessness. <laughs> so, the so slaughter dyke -like says that if uh, uh, literal amphibians, frogs, are choosing between air and water, uh, the figural amphibian is is choosing amongst worlds. And um, in my new book, Emerging Ecologies, I, I describe a number of these figural amphibians. Uh, uh, insisting that uh, there's multiple species of, of ontological amphibians. Humans are not exceptional in our ability to um, go amongst worlds, choose worlds. And uh, I, I talk about an ant from, from Panama, the monkeys in Florida. Um, and, and it seems like the beaver is an exceptional example of not only a critter that's uh, moving amongst these worlds, but actually engaged in worlding. I mean, it's profoundly... Um, changing these landscapes by, by building these dams and y y you have a classic anthropological text exploring this too you know Morgan's accounting of the, the engineering knowledge and, and culture of the beaver and I'd love to just hear more about beavers as a, a, a world making force. Uh, I think uh, and so so I think that the um, uh, yeah, I mean, beavers are just incredible. I, I, I interviewed a bunch of, um, of, or several trappers who are hired by state agency who, who to try to trap and kill beavers. And um, and even the most, um, even the most, I would say, rigid conservation biologists who are very much pro total eradication um, are just in awe of beavers. I mean, they really are these incredible animals. But but I think for for me what's uh, interesting I think is to try to move away from this idea that all these beavers are the same right so that that this discussion which is just about getting rid of beaver suggests that they're all the same kind of thing and and I think this kind of relational ontology helps us reframe that kind of debate away from the practicalities and possibilities of eradication to one that is perhaps more ethically situated. Um, and that's my kind of point here is to explore like how can we think of politics and ethics that is much more situated within assemblages rather than a kind of um, kind of global law about what does and doesn't belong. Um, and, and I also think what's quite interesting is that that's a, a conversation that's happening in ecology too, with with theorists in ecology, um, and and so I've been interested in how debates within or discussions within philosophy are are dovetailing with what ecologists are thinking as well. Mm. And so I'm trying to use this beaver thing as a way of trying to play with that a little bit um, in, in thinking about ethics in different ways. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd also love to give presence to a group of artists, uh, the Rice, Righteous Fur Collective in New Orleans, who are grappling with uh, Nutria. So, um, oh, no. Donna Haraway describes lively capital, a, a form of capital that has um, ethics and utility, commerce and consciousness uh, 
evolution and bioengineering, I'll, I'll build into it. And and I think these these artists are really playing, you know, with with these surprising articulations of capital um, to rearticulate um, uh, uses in, in, in an economy where um, you know fur is no longer fashionable. Fo following. Um, outrage by PETA and other animal activists, you know, throwing blood, fake blood on, on women in New York wearing fur. It's not something that people wear much these days. Um, but this this collective of artists, uh, the, the Righteous Fur Group, um, led by Calamity and Cree McCree and others, um, they've, they've started hosting tranny drag shows uh, fe featuring <laughs> models wearing um, bikinis and, and nutria fur or um, dressed up to the nines and, and all, all sorts of so somewhat macabre uh, 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 high fashion. Um, you know, they, they've also uh, got, uh, you can buy earrings with, with nutria te teeth or, or necklaces. And, and I'm wondering if, if um, in... Uh, the areas that you've been working, if if the beaver is uh, brought into new economies of, of use, if if people are trying to reinvest those pelts with value in, in an economy where fur isn't fashionable, um, or if well, they're eating, or what other what other things are going on? I mean, I think in cold places, in 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 some cold, I, I mean, I do think fur is not fashionable in in the United States, but um, I in lots of the world it certainly is, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But Sammy reindeer herders are certainly wearing fur. <laughs> People in Alaska <laughs> do. But I I would say that um, that that is definitely Ch Chile the Chilean government has tried to figure out ways to as well as the Argentinian government to try to capitalize these and turn these beavers into commodities. But what's so interesting about that, and I think some of the work that geographers have done about lively commodities and the materiality of commodities is really interesting because there's they, they've tried to hire trappers, they've tried to hand out free traps, they've given training seminars on it, but in, the fact of the matter is it's so remote and there's no roads, they can't get the fur out. So it's it's like the the landscape itself is like pushing back, um, and it's quite hard to um, to skin beavers too. It turns out with beavers, the most valuable part is their scent glands because of castorium, uh, which is made in fancy French perfumes. And so my collaborator that I'm working with on this project has a a, a residency right now. Uh, Christy Gast in Los Angeles at a scent museum and so she's doing some scent art uh, to try to think through this in a, in a different kind of way. Uh, in Ushuaia on the Argentine side they've started what I've been calling beaver safaris where they take tourists who are want to go to Antarctica out into the country to see to see beavers which is just an incredible thing because you, you can't ever see them. <laughs> so they just take <laughs> tourists. I went do these rivers, but of course during the daytime the beavers are all underwater. Mm. So, so I, I think I think it's interesting the ways in which um, dreams of empire and commodification fail because of the actual places they're at. Like some places are just not suitable for capitalism in the same kinds of ways. Mm. Yes, thanks so much. I, I was struck, um, I guess, by a similar text uh, that everyone was talking about, but, but you know, Tim, you know, Tim Ingold's discussion of beavers, mm -hmm. uh, and the the sort of niceness, I guess, of the link with diaspora, because beavers are also home builders in lots of ways. Yeah. Um, and they're assemblers, so the the, the, the the sort of the language of assemblage and and diaspora, and it's linked to home in a way, has a nice mm -hmm. resonance with what beavers are on about. <laughs> they are literally building homes in a way. Uh, and right. so I guess that I really wanted to see if you wanted to reflect on that a little bit. But also, there's a sort of interesting um, question, I guess, around the politics of the word assemblage. Because I, I guess it also implies a sense that uh, if, if, we, if we, I guess, adopt that, 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 sort, of, that sort of notion of, 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 of a kind of contingency of assemblage, it also, in a sense, implies a sense that things may be also reassembled in interesting sorts of ways, which, which I think, as you've articulated, don't prefigure a kind of one, you know, a kind of one size fits all kind of eradicationist perspective. But it also in, in, it implies a kind of situated uh, attention to detail. 
right. to what it might mean to reassemble the world in, 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 sympathetic, in sympathetic ways. Right, right. I think so. I, and I love the way that you picked up about this thing about diaspora and this kind of yearning for home. Um, and what's interesting, so the kind of possibilities that get opened up by thinking diaspora when we think about animals instead of other things, it allows us to also use other kinds of lenses that we associate with the social, such as kinship, which which, which is beaver and labor. I mean, beavers as as beings are 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 epitomized like these practices of kinship and labor that are just astounding. And so to think about how we rethink other beings using these kind of these other things, diaspora, kinship, sociability, um, longing, etc. For me, has been uh, what has been the, the most helpful in kind of thinking through a kind of different kind of ethics um, when it comes to this sort of environmental change. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, just want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the the intervention is super smart, and uh, it definitely gives us a, a, a new keyword for grappling with these these uh, global communities that uh, spread spread across uh, time and space in surprising ways. So, so thank you again, and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, and you guys have a great holiday. You too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Cheers.